The hearing will come to order. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. Our obligation is to work tirelessly with citizen watchdogs and whistleblowers to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. On September 11, 2012, four Americans were murdered by terrorists. It was the 11th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks on New York and Washington. Recognizing that the witnesses before us are actual experts on what really happened before, during, and after the Benghazi attacks, I am not going to recount those events or decisions. These witnesses deserve to be heard on the Benghazi attacks, the flaws in the Accountability Review Board's methodology, process, and conclusion. Before I introduce these witnesses and explain some of our efforts to learn more about what happened in Benghazi, can we have those doors closed, please? I want to take a moment to reflect on and to recognize the brave Americans who lost their lives in that attack that day. I also want to note that there are friends and immediate family of those killed or injured that are with us here today. J. Christopher Stevens, U.S. Ambassador to Libya. Sean Patrick Smith, Information Management Specialist. Tyrone Woods, Security Specialist and former Navy SEAL. Glenn Doherty, Security Specialist and former Navy SEAL. Our goal in this investigation is to get answers, because their families deserve answers. They were promised answers at the highest level when their bodies came home. The President was there, the Vice President was there, the Secretary of Defense was there, the Secretary of State was there. We want to make certain those promises are kept on behalf of those individuals. We also want to make certain that our government learns the proper lessons from this tragedy so it never happens again and so that the right people are held accountable. I want those watching this proceeding to know that we have made extensive efforts to engage the administration and to see and hear their facts. The administration, however, has not been cooperative, and unfortunately, our minority has mostly sat silent as we have made these requests. Some examples. On February 22, this committee wrote to Ambassador Pickering and Admiral Mullen who, as required by law, were appointed by Secretary Clinton and co-chaired the Accountability Review Board investigation. We asked them to testify about their investigations and findings. They refused, and our minority said nothing. When we asked Ambassador Pickering and Admiral Mullen to speak with us and our committee informally, they again refused, and again there was silence by the minority. Okay. When five House committee chairmen wrote the White House and requested relevant documents about the Benghazi attacks, we were refused. The committee's minority did not join in a similar call for transparency, and I wish they had. On April 29, this committee asked the State Department to make nine current and former officials with relevant information available for this hearing or a separate transcribed interview. The State Department did not even respond. 
and to date the minority has not made a similar request. Mr. Cummings, I would like nothing more than to have you work with me on this investigation. Because we have worked on other areas together, I still hold out hope that one day you will stand with me as this administration doesn't cooperate, when they ignore our inquiries. And when that day comes, together we will be far more effective. And now for our witnesses, or should I say our whistleblowers. Mr. Mark Thompson is the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary in the State Department, State Department of Bureau of Counterterrorism. Welcome. Mr. Gregory Hicks is a 22-year veteran Foreign Service officer and the former Deputy Chief of Mission for the U.S. Embassy in Libya. After Ambassador Stevens was murdered, Mr. Her Her Mr. Hicks became the acting chief of mission, or as they say, the charge d'affaires. He was, in fact, in Libya, its highest ranking officer, if you will, America's representative in Libya. Mr. Eric Nordstrom is a former is the former regional security officer in Libya and perhaps the foremost and most knowledgeable person about security requests that were made and denied to the U.S. diplomatic mission in Libya and in Benghazi, ultimately in Benghazi. Mr. Cummings, we will have from time to time our disagreements, but I know that for all the members of this committee, we understand that these disagreements must be kept on this side of the dais. These brave witnesses deserve this committee's call to testify. These brave whistleblowers are, in fact, what makes this committee's work work. We are the committee that oversees and that led for new whistleblower protections signed by this President. The public has a right to hear their accounts, and we, more than any other committee in the Congress, must respect whistleblowers and work on a bipartisan basis always to protect them. With that, I recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for calling this hearing. And um, I want to be clear, and I have said it over and over again, there is no member of this Congress be they Republican or Democrat, who fails to uphold the right of whistleblowers to come forward. And I think it is sad when that accusation is made against any member of this Congress. And so to the hearing, I, too, and all of our members, both Republicans and Democrats, were tremendously saddened by the deaths of J. Christopher Stevens, Sean Patrick Smith, Tyrone Woods, and Glenn Doherty. They were servants of the public. They, like our whistleblowers, were people who dedicated their lives to making a difference, and they saw the world as bigger than just them. They were the ones that were often unseen, unnoticed, unappreciated, and unapplauded. We have actually seen some of that with regard to public employees in this Congress. But yet and still, day after day, they went out there and they did their jobs. And on behalf of this Congress and a grateful nation, I say thank you. I am glad the whistleblowers are here. And I will do every single thing in my power to protect the whistleblowers. As a matter of fact, just on May 7, 2013, I sent a letter to John Kerry. And I said in that letter that despite the highly partisan nature of the Committee's actions, it nevertheless remains very important, and this is a quote, to me personally to make clear to all government agencies and employees who choose to come forward to Congress that their interests will be protected 
For these reasons, I request that the Department remind its employees of their rights with respect to providing information to Congress, as well as their responsibilities not to retaliate against individuals who exercise those rights. The Department may already do this as a matter of course, in which case I ask that you provide an update on the status of those efforts. Whistleblowers are important. They are very important. One of the things that I have said in this meeting room over and over again is that we must be effective and efficient. And one of the major roles of this committee is to make sure that government works properly. And so, Mr. to all of our witnesses, thank you. Mr. Hicks, I would like to start by expressing my gratitude for your service and my condolences for your loss. I can only imagine what you went through on the night of the attacks. If I had been in your place, hearing Ambassador Stevens' voice on the phone and wanting to do everything possible to help him, I would have had the same questions you had. Where is the military? Where are the special forces? Where are the fighter jets to rescue my colleagues? These are legitimate questions, and I wanted to know the answers myself. For example, last week, there was a widely publicized news report that a team in Europe called the Commanders in Extremist Force could have gotten to Benghazi before the second attack. When I heard this claim, I wrote to the Secretary of Defense immediately. Yesterday, I received an official response. It says this press report was wrong. The team was too far away, and the logistical requirements were too great. Others have suggested that F-16s, stations at Aviano Air Force Base in Italy, could have gotten there in time. But according to General Martin Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who testified before the Senate in February, he said they could not. And this is our highest ranking military member. The fact is that our nation's top military commanders have already testified repeatedly that they did everything in their power to mobilize and deploy assets as soon as possible, and every independent and bipartisan review has confirmed this fact. We have the best military in the world, but even with all of their technological advances, they could not get there in time. Mr. Hicks, I know these answers provide no comfort to you or the families of the victims, but this is the testimony Congress has received, and I have seen nothing to make me question the truthfulness of our nation's military commanders. Our committee has a fundamental obligation to, to conduct responsible oversight, and that includes carefully examining the information that you and others provide. But we also have a duty to thoroughly investigate these claims before we make public accusations. In contrast, what we have seen over the past two weeks is a full-scale media campaign that is not designed to investigate what happened in a responsible and bipartisan way, but rather a launch unfounded of unfounded accusations to smear public officials. Let me be clear. I am not questioning the motives of our witnesses. I am questioning the motives of those who want to use their statements for political purposes. Chairman Issa has accused the administration of intentionally withholding military assets which could have helped save lives on the night of the attacks. I say for political reasons. Of all the irresponsible allegations leveled over the past two weeks, this is the most troubling. And based on what our military commanders have told us, this allegation is simply untrue. Chairman Issa suggested that four military personnel were told to stay in Tripoli rather than board a plane in Benghazi at 6 a.m the morning after the attack, supposedly because of the administration's political desire not to have a presence in Benghazi. There is no evidence to support this. As Mr. Hicks told the committee, one plane had already left for Benghazi at 1.15 a.m. that night, and it included a seven-person security team with two military personnel. The decision the next morning to keep four military personnel in place in Tripoli was not made by the White House or the State Department. By, but by the military chain of command. There are other allegations Chairman Issa went on national TV 
and accused Secretary Clinton of lying to Congress. He says she personally signed the State Department cable authorizing security reductions. We have now seen this cable, and she did not sign it. Her name is printed at the bottom, just like tens of thousands of cables sent every year from the Department. As I close, the Washington Post fact checker called this accusation a whopper, that's their word, and gave it four Pinocchios. Chairman Issa attacked Ambassador Susan Rice for statements she made on Sunday talk shows, claiming the administration, quote, deliberately misled the American people. The claim has been directly contradicted by our nation's top intelligence official, General James Clapper. He testified, he has already testified before the Senate that these attacks against Ms. Rice were, quote, unfair, end of quote, because, quote, she was going on what we had given her, and that was our collective best judgment at the time. There have also been allegations that the Accountability Review Board, led by Ambassador Thomas Pickering and Admiral M Mike Mullen, failed to examine the role of Ambassador Patrick Kennedy. This accusa accusation is, again, inaccurate, according to the Board. And so, Mr. Chairman, if this committee is going to suggest that General Dempsey, and General Cap Clapper, and all are all involved in a conspiracy of withholding military assets and then covering it up, and if this committee is going to accuse Ambassador Pickering and Admiral Mullen of failing to fully investigate these attacks, the least we can do is have, have them invited to, uh, be, to this hearing today or in a future hearing. And uh, according to our conversation yesterday with regard to uh, uh, Admiral Pickering and uh, Mullen, uh, you have said that uh, you plan to bring them in the future, and I, respect, I re appreciate that. Last but not least, let's make it, I want to make it very clear to our witnesses. I respect the witnesses who are here today to offer their testimony. As a lawyer and an officer of the court, I have tremendous respect for evidence. But today's hearing is not the full story. I hope we will eventually hear our military, our intelligence, and our diplomatic officials. Then I hope we can turn to the real work, as the chairman has said, of this committee, which is ensuring that the Department implements the recommendations to improve the security of our diplomatic officials serving overseas, those who are so, so often unseen, unnoticed, unappreciated, and unapplauded. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Fortunately, today, I am not the witness. I would now like to in, uh, invite our witnesses. First, Mr. Mark Thompson, a 20-year career United States Marine who two years before his retirement from the Marine Corps was assigned to the State Department, where he brought his experience in serving in all four Marine divisions and in numerous amphibious forces to the State Department. For 17 years, he has used that military experience and his accumulated knowledge of counterterrorism well. He has served and led teams in Baghdad, Iraq, in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, and in Africa. When in 1996 he joined the State Department as a U.S. Marine, he was brought there because of what he knew and what they needed to know. In 1998, when as he retired from the Marine Corps, he was transitioned at their request into civil service and was then assi assigned to what was then the Office of the Coordinator of Counterterrorism, its successor he serves and runs today. In 2004, he served with the, the, uh, excuse me, with the Coalition Provision Authority, in other words, with our forces in Baghdad. In 2006, he assumed his current position, where he advises senior leadership on operational counterterrorism matters and ensures the United States can rapidly respond to global terrorism crisis. That is his job. Addition, in addition to his responsibilities, he has led the uh, NSC's Direct Foreign Emergency Support Team, or FEST team, in support of U.S. chiefs of mission in response to terrorism events, including 
His expertise was used in that capacity when he, uh, when he was deployed in response to the 1998 East African bombings of our two embassies, the 2000 bombing of the USS Cole, and hostage and recovery efforts in Latin America, Southeast Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Welcome. <coughs> Mr. Gregory Hicks, in more than 22 years in the Foreign Service, Mr. Hicks has served notably in Libya, but also in Afghanistan, in Bahrain, where we first met, in Yemen, in Syria, where we met again, and in Gambia. Prior to his assignment in Libya, handpicked to be the Deputy Chief of Mission by the now deceased Ambassador Chris Stevens, he also served four tier tours here in Washington. He was the Deputy Director of the Office of Investment Affairs, Special Assistant to the Under Secretary for Economic, Energy and Agricultural Affairs, Trade Policy Negotiator for the Office of the United States Trade Representative, and Country Officer for Vietnam, Oman, and Yemen. Mr. Hicks played key roles in a number of important historic events with uh, this country and the State Department, Vietnam's accession to the World Trade Organization, the U.S.-Bahrain Free Trade Agreement, the U.S.-Vietnam Bilateral Trade Agreement, and the renegotiation of U.S. forces based in Oman. Mr. Hicks is the recipient of five meritorious service uh, increases, three individual superior honor awards, three individual meritorious honor awards, and numerous group awards for his service. Thank you. Mr. Nordstrom, in his 15 years at the State Department, he has served in Washington, D.C., in Honduras, in Ethiopia, in India, and most recently he was the Regional Security Officer for the U.S. Uh, mission to Libya, based out of Tripoli. In that capacity, as RSO in Tripoli, from September 2011 to July of 2012, he was the principal security officer advising both Ambassador Kretz, Kretz and Ambassador Stevens on security and law enforcement matters. Prior to joining the uh, Department of State, Mr. Nordstrom also served in federal law enforcement at the Department of Treasury. Welcome to all three of you. Would you please rise, as is pursuant to our rules, and take the oath? Do you solemnly swear, or please raise your right hands, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please, let, please have a seat. Let the record reflect all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Now, I am going to note that I have read your opening statements, and they are unusually short. So I am not worried about the five minutes, but we are here to hear from you. So take the time you, ha you need to, tell your story, we will listen, and uh, uh, the ordinary uh, time is five minutes. You take a little less, you take a little more. This, this hearing is about hearing from you on your experience. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the committee. And, and please pull your microphone a little closer. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to tell a story. Uh, as the Chairman indicated, I came to the Department uh, 16 and a half years ago uh, as a Marine, transitioned, and uh, have been on the uh, activities that he's, he has already described. The night that I was uh, involved in uh, this incident, I was at my desk uh, at the end of the day when the first reports came in that indicated that uh, we had an attack going on at our diplomatic facility in Benghazi. In that facility, uh, we knew we had our ambassador and we had his security personnel. Later when I heard that the situation had evolved to uh, them going to a safe haven and then uh, the fact that we could not find the ambassador, I alerted my leadership 
indicating that we needed to uh, go forward and consider the deployment of the foreign emergency support team. That particular team is an interagency team. It's uh, been represented as something that the State Department uh, deploys. It does not. Uh, the Deputies Committee of the National Security Council deploys that organization. But uh, I wanted that uh, considered. I, I notified uh, the White House of my uh, idea. Uh, they indicated that meetings had already taken place that evening that uh, had taken FEST uh, out of the uh, menu of options. Uh, I called the office within the State Department that uh, had been represented there, uh, asking them why it had been taken off the table and was told that it was uh, not the right time and it was not the uh, team that needed to go right then. Let me explain the team a little more. It, it is comprised of the leadership from my office. It is comprised of uh, professionals from Special Operations Command, from Diplomatic Security, from the Intelligence Community, from FBI. It is a holistic, comprehensive organization that is designed to go forward to embassies just as we did as indicated in 1998 in East Africa as we've done in the other places indicated the USS Cole and other hostage situations. It is designed to be the glue and the connective tissue that, that gets all the options on the table for the decision makers. Decision makers in, in my line of work are the chief of mission and uh, the authorities back here in Washington that make the decisions of what, where we send people into harm's way. It doesn't mean it has a pro, it, it has a irreversibility to it. The other thing that I, I uh, pointed out was that with the tyranny of distance, uh, at least eight or nine hours to get to uh, the middle of the Mediterranean, uh, we needed to act now and not wait. Uh, there's uh, sometimes the uh, hesitancy to not uh, deploy because we don't know what's going on. One definition of a crisis is you don't know what's going to happen in two hours. So you need to help develop that situation early. We have a robust comms uh, suite on the airplane that we uh, tra are transported on. It is ably flown by my uh, SOCOM colleagues. Uh, it is on alert to do just this mission and it's designed to carry a comprehensive team to a conflict or a crisis and to help the ambassador and work for the ambassador and or the chief of mission to uh, handle that crisis and to make sure he or she has the best information possible to make decisions and to make recommendations back to Washington. And those same representatives make uh, their views known back to their parent organizations so that when we do have deputies committees and principal committees meetings at the White House, we have a situation in which everyone is, is uh, using the uh, most uh, up-to-date information and so that we can figure out whether what we have to do security-wise, what we have to do intelligence-wise, what we have to do with the military, what we have to do diplo diplomatic-wise, what we have to do on the public affairs front that works for the chief of mission, and I can't emphasize that enough. We are not there to subsume any activities. The, the experts on the uh, team uh, are, know that the real experts are in the embassy, and they work for the chief of mission to do that. Uh, my time is drawing to a close. I'll end there and await your questions. Thank you. Mr. Hicks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We really will have to. You're a pretty soft smoke and get it a little closer. I'll and try to get this up here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member. Thank you, members of the committee. I am a career public servant. Until the aftermath of Benghazi, I loved every day of my job. In my 21 years of government service prior to Tripoli, I earned a reputation for being an innovative policymaker who got the job done. I was promoted quickly and received numerous awards. People who worked for me rated my leadership and management skills highly. I have two master's degrees from the University of Michigan in applied economics and modern Near Eastern and North African studies. I have served my country extensively in the Mideast, 
Besides Libya, I served in Afghanistan, Bahrain, Yemen, Syria, and the Gambia. I speak fluent Arabic. In Bahrain, my Shia opposition contacts gave me advance warning of impending attacks on our embassy and anti-government, anti-American demonstrations, allowing us to prepare and avoid injuries to staff. I learned that knowledge of local conditions and strong connections with the local population are as important as the strength and height of walls. One reason I am here is because I have pledged to the Foreign Service as part of my campaign to be State Vice President of the American Foreign Service Association that none of us should ever again experience what we went through in Tripoli and Benghazi on 9-11-2012. After I arrived in Tripoli as Deputy Chief of Mission on July 31, 2012, I fast became known as the Ambassador's Bulldog because of my decisive management style. In the days immediately after the Benghazi attack, the President and Secretary of State praised my performance over the telephone. President Obama wrote Libyan President Magariev expressing confidence in my abilities. Deputy Secretary Burns and General Hamm told me how much they appreciated how I handled the night of the assault and its aftermath. I received written notes of commendation from Under Secretary Wendy Sherman and from Executive Secretary Stephen Mull. Incoming Charge Larry Pope told me personally that my performance was near heroic. In February 1991, I swore an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. I am here today to honor that oath. I look forward to answering your questions fully and truthfully. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I understand that some of those commendations and letters are in your opening statement. And for all the witnesses, uh, all, all extraneous material or other insertions will be placed in the record on your behalf. Mr. Nordstrom. Good morning, Chair Good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and other distinguished members of the committee. For the benefit of the new committee members, my name is Eric Nordstrom, and I currently serve as the Supervisory Special Agent with the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Diplomatic Security. Since September 2012, I have been enrolled in long-term language training in preparation for my next assignment. As Chairman Issa noted, I have served in federal law enforcement since January 1996, first as a customs inspector before joining the U.S. Department of State. I have served in domestic and overseas postings, including Washington, D.C., Honduras, Ethiopia, India, and most recently, the regional security officer at the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli. All of those assignments have been assignments in which I have faced uh, the threat of criminal or terrorist uh, attacks. I held the last position as RSO from September 21, 2011 and until July 26, 2012. As the Regional Security Officer, or RSO, at the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli, I served as the Principal Security Advisor to U.S. Ambassadors Eugene Kretz and Chris Stevens on security and law enforcement matters. I want to thank the Committee again for the opportunity to appear, provide further testimony in support of your inquiry into the tragic events of September 11, 2012. I would also like to thank the Committee for your continued efforts in investigating all the details and all the decisions related to the attack on our diplomatic facility. Specifically, the Committee's labors to uncover what happened prior, during, and after the attack matter. It matters to me personally, and it matters to my colleagues, <clears throat> to my colleagues at the Department of State. It matters to the American public for whom we serve. And most importantly, <clears throat> excuse me, it matters to the friends and family of, <clears throat> of Ambassador Stevens, Sean Smith, Glenn Doherty, and Tyrone Woods, who were murdered on September 11, 2012. In addition to my testimony before this committee in October 2012, I also met with the FBI 
Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, the Department's Accountability Review Board, and I have discussed my experiences in Libya with all of them. I am proud of the work that our team accomplished in Libya under extraordinarily difficult circumstances, the protection of our nation's diplomats, our embassies and consulates, and the work produced there is de deserving of the time that this committee, other congressional committees, and the Accountability Review Board, and no doubt future review efforts, will invest in making sure that we get this process right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, for the opportunity to appear before you today. I stand ready to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. I will now recognize myself for a quick round of questioning. Mr. Thompson, I'm, no, no, Mr. Thompson, you went through a process of things that you uh, observed and how you tried to activate your team. Did you do so because you had an initial view of whether this was a terrorist attack or something else? And please be brief. I want to use my time. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hicks, as the principal officer uh, and the, the high, you know, once the ambassador had been murdered, the highest ranking officer uh, on September 11th, from the moment that you unexpectedly became the charge, America has heard many accounts of what happened. We have never heard accounts from a single person who was in Libya that night. You will be the first person who observed it. In your own words, take as much time as you want. Please take us through the day of September 11th from whatever time you want to begin through when you first heard from Ambassador Stevens and through the hours and days uh, immediately following that, if you would, so we could have an understanding for the first time from somebody who was there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as, as I remember September 11, 2012, it was a routine day at our embassy. And until we saw the news about Cairo, and I remember sending a text message to Ambassador Stevens saying, Chris, are you aware of what's going on in Cairo? And he said, no. Uh, so I told him that the embassy, in another text, that the embassy had been stormed and they were trying to tear down our flag. And he said, thanks very much. And you know, then I went on with, uh, with, with business. closed, closed uh, the day, and I went back to my villa and was relaxing, watching a television show that I particularly like. And at 9.45 p.m., and all times will be Libyan times, the six-hour time difference, the RSO John Martinek ran into my villa, yelling, Greg, Greg, the consulate's under attack. And I stood up and reached for my phone because I had an inkling or thought that perhaps the ambassador had tried to call me to relay the same message. And I found two missed calls on the phone, one from the ambassador's phone, one from a phone number I didn't recognize. And I punched the phone number I didn't recognize, and I got the ambassador on the other end. And he said, Greg, we're under attack. And I was walking out of the villa on my way to the Tactical Operations Center, because I knew we would all have to gather there to mobilize or try to mobilize a response. And it was also a, a bad cell phone night in Tripoli. Connections were weak. And I said, OK, and the line cut. As I walked to the Tactical Operations Center, I tried to reach back on both of the numbers, the unknown number and the ambassador's personal number and got no response. When I got to the Tactical Operations Center, I told people that the ambassador, that I had just talked to the ambassador and what he said. Uh, at the time, John Martinek was on the phone with Alec Henderson in Benghazi, the RSO there. 
And uh, I asked one of our DS agents, who, what number did I reach Ambassador Stevens on? And he said, oh, that's Scott Wickland's telephone. Scott Wickland was Ambassador Stevens' agent in charge, his personal escort for that night, and was with him in the villa during the attack. So I asked, uh, when John Martinek got off the telephone, I asked him what was going on, and he said that the consulate had been breached and there were at least 20 uh, hostile individuals armed in the, in the compound at the time. So I next called the annex chief to ask him if he was in touch with the Benghazi annex to activate our emergency response plan. Please explain the annex chief so that people that don't know as much would understand that. No, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. And he said that he had been in touch with the annex in Benghazi, and they said they were mobilizing a response team there to go to, the, to our facility and provide reinforcements and to repel the attack. With that knowledge, I called the operations center at the State Department at approximately 10 p.m. to report the attack and what we were doing to respond to it. The next thing I did was to begin calling the senior officials in the government of Libya that I knew at the time. And so I dialed first President Magariev's chief of staff and reported the attack and asked for immediate assistance from the government of Libya to assist our folks in Benghazi. I followed that up with a call to the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff to make the same request, and then to the MFA, America's Director. MFA is Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The defense attache was at the same time calling the leadership of Libya's military with the same purpose, to ask them for assistance. Once that was done, I called again to Washington to report that these ac actions had been commenced. Over the night, we, over that night, that is basically how our team operated. I was talking to the government of, Lib of Libya, reporting to the State, State Department through the Operations Center, and also staying in touch with the Annex Chief about what was going on. Uh, let me step back one minute, if I could, and say that I also discussed with the Annex Chief about mobilizing a Tripoli response team, and we agreed that we would move forward with a chartering a plane from Tripoli to fly a response team to Benghazi to provide additional reinforcements. The defense attache was also reporting through his chain of command back to AFRICOM and to the joint staff here in Washington about what was going on in the country. David McFarland, our political section chief, had just returned from Benghazi, where he had been our principal officer for the previous 10 days. And so he jumped into this picture by reaching out to his contacts in, ben in Benghazi and trying to get them at the local level there to respond to the attack. And he also was in touch with our local employee there as well. Excuse me if I yeah, check my notes here. It's a long. The attack unfolded in four phases, or the night unfolded in four phases. The first phase was the attack on our consulate. 
This story is well known, I think. The Benghazi response, the, the uh, consulate was invaded. The Villa C, where the ambassador and Sean Smith and Scott Wick Wickland were uh, hiding in the safe area, was set on fire. Uh, the attackers also went into another built went into another of buildings. They were unable to enter the tactical operations center in Benghazi because of improvements to that facility that had been made. They Scott attempted to lead the ambassador and Sean Smith out of the burning building. He managed to make it out. Uh, he tried repeatedly to go back in to try to rescue Sean and the ambassador, but had to stop due to exposure to smoke. The response team from the annex in Benghazi, six individuals, drove the attackers out of our compound and secured it temporarily. There have been estimates as high as 60 attackers were in the compound at one particular time. There were repeated attempts by all of the RSOs and by the response team from the annex to go into the burning building and recover or try to save Sean and the ambassador. They found Sean's body and pulled it out, but he was no longer responsive. They did not find the ambassador. And I spoke with a medical officer, one of our medical officers, after, after the attack. And the heroism of these individuals in repeatedly going into a petroleum-based fire cannot be understated. Petroleum, according to, this, to our regional medical officer, petroleum-based fires emit enormous amounts of cyanide gas. And he told me that one full breath of that would incapacitate and kill a person if exposed to it. A second, it was, it was noticed that a second wave of attackers was coming to attack the facility. And our teams evacuated five RSOs and Sean Smith in one vehicle, which suffered heavy fire, but they managed to break through and re get to the annex. And then the uh, annex team also withdrew from the facility, and the second wave of atta attackers took it over. After the, the second phase of the evening occurs, uh, the timing is about 11.30 or so. The second phase commences after the teams have returned to the annex, and they suffer for about an hour and a half probing attacks from, uh, from terrorists. They are able to repulse them, and then they desist at about 1.30 in the morning. The Tripoli response team departs at about midnight and arrives at about 1.15 in Benghazi. If I may step back again to Tripoli and what's going on there at this point. At about 10.45 or 11 o'clock, we confer. And I asked the defense attache who had been talking with AFRICOM and with the joint staff, is anything coming? Will they be sending us any help? Is there something out there? <laughs> and he answered that the nearest help was in Aviano, and the nearest they were, where there were fighter planes. They said that it would take two to three hours for them to get on site, but that there also were no tankers available for them to refuel. And I said, thank you very much. And we went on with our work. Phase three begins with news that the ambassador 
ambassador's body has been recovered. And David McFarland, if I recall correctly, is the individual who began to receive that news from his contacts in Benghazi. And we began to hear also that the ambassador has been taken to a hospital. We don't know initially which hospital it is, but we, through David's reports, we learn that it is in a hospital which is controlled by Ansara Sharia, the group that Twitter feeds had identified as leading the attack on the consulate. We're getting this information as the Tripoli response team arrives in Benghazi at the airport. Both our annex chief and the annex chief in Benghazi and our defense attache are on the phone during this period trying to get the Libyan government to send vehicles and military and or security assets to the airport to assist our, our response team. At this point, this response team looks like it may be a hostage rescue team that they are going to, we are going to need to send them to try to save the ambassador who is in a hospital that is, as far as we know, under enemy control. Our contacts with the government in Tripoli are telling us that the ambassador is in a safe place, but they imply that he is with us in, in the annex in Benghazi. And we keep telling them, no, the, he is not with us. We do not have his, we do not have him. At about 12.30, at the same time that we see the Twitter feeds that are asserting that Ansara Sharia is responsible for the attack, we also see a call for an attack on the embassy in Tripoli. And so we begin to, we, we had always thought that we were in, under threat, but we now have to take care of ourselves and we begin planning to evacuate our facility. When I say our facility, I mean the State Department residential compound in Tripoli and to consolidate all of our personnel in, at the annex in Tripoli. We have about 55 diplomatic personnel in the two annexes. On that night, if I may go back, I would just like to point out that with Ambassador Stevens and Sean Smith in Benghazi, there are five diplomatic security agents, assistant re, uh, regional security officers. With us in, in our residential compound in Tripoli, we have the RSO John Martinek, three assistant regional security officers protecting 28 diplomatic personnel. In addition, we also have four special forces personnel who are part of the training mission. During the night, I'm in touch with Washington, We're keeping them posted of what's happening in Tripoli and to, to the best of my knowledge what I'm being told in Benghazi. I think at about 2 p.m., the secret 2 a.m., sorry, the Secretary, called, Secretary of State Clinton called me along, and along with her senior staff, we're all on the phone. And she asked me what was going on and I briefed her on developments most of the conversation was about the search for Ambassador Stevens. It was also about what we were going to do with our personnel in Benghazi. 
and I told her that we would need to evacuate. And that was the right, she said that was the right thing to do. At about 3 a.m., I received a call from the Prime Minister of Libya. I think it's the saddest phone call I've ever had in my life. He told me that Ambassador Stevens had passed away. I immediately telephoned Washington that news afterwards. And began accelerating our effort to withdraw from the Illis compound and move to the annex. The, excuse me, I'm taking a glass of water. Our team responded with amazing discipline and courage in Tripoli in organizing our withdrawal. I have vivid memories of that. I think the most telling, though, was of our communications staff dismantling our, our, our communications equipment to take with us to the annex and destroying the classified communications capability. Our office manager, Amber Pickens, was everywhere that night just throwing herself into some task that had to be done. First, she was taking a log of what we were doing. Then she was loading magazines, carrying ammunition to the, carrying our ammunition supply to the, our vehicles. Then she was smashing hard drives with an ax. Alan Greenfield, our management officer, was a whirlwind of activity, organizing the vehicles to lining them up, finding the drivers, making sure everybody was getting the things that they would need for the coming days. John Martinick was a mountain of moral support, particularly to the guys who were in Benghazi. He was on the phone talking them through the whole ordeal. David McFarland on the phone constantly, all the time, talking to his contacts in Benghazi, urging, urging them to help. Lieutenant Colonel Phillips and Lieutenant Colonel Arndt, Lieutenant Colonel Gibson, mountains of strength. I'm odd. I'm still in awe of them. They asked me uh, in one of the phone calls, when were you going to move to the annex? And I said, we'll move at dawn. Because none of our people had great experience driving the armored suburbans that we were, were going to have to use. Our local staff drove for us as part of our security procedures. They, of course, were not there that night. And we would have to go through checkpoints, militia checkpoints, on the way to the annex to get there. And I didn't want our people to be going through those checkpoints, because I didn't know what to expect from the militias. And so we moved at dawn. And we arrived at the annex, at least my group, I think, at about 4.45, perhaps maybe 5 a.m. And a few minutes later came the word of the mortar attack. If I could 
return to Benghazi a little bit. I'll talk through Tripoli. I'm sorry if I bounce back and forth, but the Tripoli team was basically had to stay at the Benghazi airport because they had no transport and no escort from the, the, the Libyans. After the announcement of Chris's passing, military escort and vehicles arrived at the airport. So the decision was made for them to go to the annex. One of the, before I got the call from the Prime Minister, we had received several phone calls on the phone that had been with the ambassador saying that we know where the ambassador is, please, you can come get him. And our local staff engaged on those phone calls admirably. Uh, asking very, very good, outstanding, even open-ended questions about where was he, trying to decide, discern whether he was alive, would you let, whether they even had the ambassador, whether that person was with the ambassador. Send a picture, could we talk to the ambassador? Because we knew separately from David that the ambassador was in a hospital, that we believed was under Ansar Sharia's call, we, we suspected that we were being baited into a trap. And so we did not want to go send our people into an ambush. And we didn't, we sent them to the annex. Shortly after they arrived at the annex, the mortars came in. First mortar round was long. It landed actually among the Libyans who escorted our people. They took casualties for us that, that night. When the, the next was short, the next three landed on the, on the roof, killing Glenn and Tyrone, severely wounding David. They didn't know whether any more Mortars were going to come in. The accuracy was terribly precise. The call was, the next one is coming through the roof, maybe if it hit. Two of the guys from Team Tripoli, they climbed up on the, the, the roof. They carried Glenn's body and Tyrone's body down. One guy, about Mark's size, full combat gear, climbed up there, strapped David Uben, who's a large man, to his back, carried him down the ladder, saved him. In Tripoli, we had the defense attaché had persuaded the Libyans to fly their C-130 to Benghazi. We wanted to airlift. We had, since we had consolidated at the annex and the Libyan government had now provided us with external security around our facilities, we wanted to send further reinforcements to Benghazi. We determined that Lieutenant Colonel Gibson and his team of Special Forces troops should go. The people in Benghazi had been fighting all night. They were tired, they were exhausted. We wanted to make sure the airport was secure for their withdrawal. As Colonel Gibson and his three personnel were, were getting in the cars. He, he stopped and he called them off and said, told me that he had not been authorized to go. The vehicles 
had to go because the flight needed to go to Tripoli, I mean to Benghazi. Lieutenant Colonel Gibson was furious. I had told him to go bring our people home. That's what he wanted to do. Paid me a very nice compliment. I won't repeat it here. So the plane went. I think it landed in Benghazi around 7.30. The other thing that we did was, and, and I want to mention Jackie Levesque's name in this hearing. She was our nurse. We initially thought that we would, that she should go to Benghazi. One of the uh, special forces with Lieutenant Colonel Gibson's team was, uh, was our last military trained medic available. I had a broken foot in a cast. I still remember him walking, around, walking to go and get in the car with his machine gun, carrying a machine gun on his shoulder. But Jackie, I, I, I refused to allow her to go to Benghazi because I knew we had wounded coming back. I knew David was severely wounded, and I knew others were wounded as well. And Jackie had just made uh, terrific contacts with a hospital in town. And so we sent, we sent her, I sent her to that hospital to start mobilizing their ER teams and their doctors to receive our wounded. So that when the charter flight arrived in Tripoli, we had an ambulances at the, hosp at, the, at the airport waiting. Their doctors were ready and waiting for our wounded to come in, to be brought in to the operating room. And they certainly saved David Ubbins' leg, and they may have very well have saved his life. And they treated our other wounded as well, as if they were their own. Mr. Hicks. Uh I know you have the days that followed, but I think we, we all need to digest a little of what you just told us. So uh, if we could pause there, and uh, Mr. Cummings is recognized. Thank you very much uh, again to all of you. We appreciate your being here. To uh, you, Mr. Hicks, as you uh, described what happened at night, um, it just reminded me of uh, the high cost, the high cost that is paid by so many of our folk in the diplomatic corps. It also reminded me of their bravery and the fact that you all um, go around the world in foreign places trying to make a difference. And um, as I listened to your testimony, I could not help but um, think about something that I said very recently, well, two years ago now, in a eulogy for a relative. I said that death is a part of life, but so often we have to find a way to make life a part of death. And I guess the reason why I'm saying that, I want to go back to something Mr. Nordstrom said when he was, um, he said that he wanted to make sure that, and you, all of you have said it pretty much, he wanted to make sure we learn from this so that um, your comrades and our four members of the diplomatic corps who sadly passed away, so that this never happens again. And I, and I appreciate it. I know this is difficult. I know it is. Um, we all feel your pain. And so I, I just want to, going back to what Mr. Nordstrom said, 
trying to make sure we have a complete picture. Because there is another piece to this, too, and that is that we have some balancing here today to do today. We have to listen to you all. Um, and and this, this is really, really difficult because we have got some statements that have made, been made, not necessarily by you, but interpreted. While, while we have to protect you, we also have to protect your fellow employees. In other words, protect is maybe not the right word, but make sure that they are treated fairly. So you, you understand what I am saying? The balance. And I am just trying to make sure I get, in your words, Mr. Nordstrom, a complete picture. That is all. Um, Mr. Hicks, in the interview with the committee staff, you stated, uh, and I quote, in my personal opinion, a fast mover flying over Benghazi at some point, you know, as soon as possible might very well have prevented some of the bad things that happened that night. Is that right? Did you say that? Yes, sir, I did. And you further stated, and I quote, I believe if we had been able to scramble a fighter or aircraft for two over Benghazi as quickly as possible after the attack commenced, I believe there would not have been a mortar attack on the annex in the morning because I believe the Libyans would have split. Is that right? Yes, sir. At a hearing in February before the Senate Armed Services Committee, General Dempsey, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was asked whether we could have deployed F-16s from Aviano Air Base in Italy, and he explained why we could not. And this, these are his words, and we are just trying to make sure we get the complete picture here. For a couple of reasons, and I quote, this is a quote, for a couple of reasons. One is that in order to deploy them, it requires the, this is the middle of the night now, these are not aircraft on strip alert. They are there as a part of our commitment to NATO and Europe. And so as we looked at the timeline, it was pretty clear that it would take up to 20 hours or so to get them there. Uh, Mr. Hicks, I understand that you wanted planes to get to Benghazi faster. If I were in your shoes, I would have wanted them to get there yesterday. And that is completely understandable. But the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said they simply could not get there quickly. Uh, Mr. Hicks, do you have any reason to question General Dempsey's testimony before the Senate? Again, I was speaking from my perspective. I understand. On the, on the ground in Tripoli, based on what the defense attache told me. And he said two to three hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there were no tankers. All right. And, and I also was speaking with reference to conversations I had had with veteran Libyan revolutionaries and other, other personnel who had experienced the Libyan revolution and who had told me that the Libyan people were very well aware of, sorry, that American and NATO air power had been decisive in their victory. And I was also speaking to their view, again, that Libyans would not stand if they were aware that American aircraft were in the vicinity. I understand. So former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta also testified in February, and he said this, and, and I quote, he said, soon after the initial reports about the attack, the President ordered all available DOD assets to respond to the attack in Libya and to protect U.S. personnel and interests in the region. Some have asked why other types of armed aircraft were not dispatched to Benghazi. 
The reason is because ARM UAVs, uh, uh, comma, AC-130 gunships or fixed-wing fighters with associated tanking, armaments, targeting, and support capabilities were not in the vicinity of Liby Libya, and because of the distance, uh, would have taken at least 9 to 12 hours, if not more, to deploy. This was pure and simple, a problem of distance and time, end of quote. Um, do you question his testimony? Sir, again, the defense attache said to me that fighter aircraft in Aviano might be able to, would not be able to be over Benghazi for two to three hours. Mr. That's Cummings. What I, I'm going on, yep. what the defense attache told me. Thank you. And, and I, uh, I assure you that in regards to your earlier statement, we will bring in people where we can have that discussion, hopefully with knowledgeable people uh, chosen for on both sides of could they or couldn't they. I, I think it's a good line of questioning, per, perhaps not for the ambassador. Mr. Chairman, I, I, you could I, certainly could have another minute. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, but it is extremely important that I ask these questions because a lot has been put out there in the air. And uh, all these folks aren't here for, for no reason. Um, and, there, and I know we will get those questions answered, but, I, but we, all we have is you today. And, and, and I'm glad to have you. But there's, in other words, I'm just trying, again, remember what I said to you all earlier. And, 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 and everybody on this committee should know, it, know this. I, I try to do everything in my power to protect witnesses. I don't care if they are called by Republicans or Democrats, because your integrity and your reputation is all you got. But I also have some other people who, whose reputations are being questioned. So I have got to you know, take what you say, and then, but I also got to consider them, too, because I, I have a duty to both of them. You follow me? Just have one last thing, Mr. Chairman, and then I will finish up. Um, and I will just close by, note, by noting that even the part, partisan report issued by um, our five Republican chairmen in April, including our good chairman Issa, cleared the, the Defense Department and said this, it says, and I quote, no evidence has been provided to suggest that these officials refuse to deploy resources because they thought the situ situation had been sufficiently resolved. I'll end there, and out of courtesy to all of our colleagues. And again, um, I don't know whether we'll get into a second round, but again, I promise you, I promise every one of you, I will do every single thing in my power to make sure. I don't. I hope there's no retaliation, but to protect you, because you are so very, very important, and it is, and it is your bravery that have brought you here today, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We now go to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the families of the victims, uh, it has been eight months. And I know that there are those who have said that is a long time ago. But the good news is there is no statute of limitations when it comes to finding out the truth, particularly for those who have served and sacrificed and died under our flags. So, Mr. Hicks, let's find out the truth. The President of Libya responded to the attack and labeled it an attack by Islamic extremists, possibly with terror links, correct? Yes, sir. So hours after our ambassador and three others are killed in Benghazi, the President of Libya says it was an attack with possible terror links, correct? Yes, sir, that's what I recall. Did the President of Libya ever mention a spontaneous protest related to a video? No, sir. When Ambassador Stevens talked to you, perhaps minutes before he died, as a dying declaration, what precisely did he say to you? He said, Greg, we are under attack. Would a highly decorated career diplomat have told you or Washington had there been a demonstration outside his facility that day? Yes, sir, he would have. Did he mention one word about a protest or a demonstration? No, sir, he did not. 
So fast forward, Mr. Hicks, to the Sunday talk shows and Ambassador Susan Rice. She blamed this attack on a video. In fact, she did it five different times. What was your reaction to that? I was stunned. My jaw dropped. And I was embarrassed. Did she talk to you before she went on the five Sunday talk shows? No, sir. You were the highest ranking official in Libya at the time, correct? Yes, sir. And she did not bother to have a conversation with you before she went on national television? No, sir. So Ambassador Rice directly contradicts the evidence on the ground in Libya. She directly contradicts the president of Libya. She directly contradicts the last statement uttered by Ambassador Stevens. Mr. Hicks, who is Beth Jones? Beth Jones is the Acting Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs at the State Department. I want to read an excerpt from an email she sent, and you were copied on it. And by the way, Mr. Chairman, for our colleagues who like to trumpet bipartisanship, this would be a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate it. Some of these emails, even though they're not classified, have not been released, Mr. Chairman, including the one that I'm going to read from. So for my colleagues, who trumpet bipartisanship, this would be a wonderful time to prove it. This is from Ms. Jones to you, to counsel for Hillary Clinton, to Victoria Nuland, to Mr. Kennedy, near as I can tell, to almost everyone in the State Department, and I'm going to read from it. I spoke to the Libyan ambassador and emphasized the importance of Libyan leaders continuing to make strong statements. By the way, Mr. Hicks, this email was sent on September the 12th the day after Benghazi, and several days before Ambassador Rice's television appearance. And I'll continue. When he said his government suspected that former Gaddafi regime elements carried out the attacks, I told him that the group that conducted the attacks, Ansar al-Sharia, is affiliated with Islamic terrorists. Let me say that again, Mr. Hicks. She told him, the State Department, on September the 12th, days before our ambassador went on national television, is telling the ambassador to Libya, the group that conducted the attacks, Ansar al-Sharia, is affiliated with Islamic terrorists. Mr. Hicks, I want to know two things. Number one, why in the world would Susan Rice go on five Sunday talk shows and perpetuate a demonstrably false narrative? And secondarily, what impact did it have on the ground in Benghazi, the fact that she contradicted the president of Libya? As the first question, I cannot provide an answer, but perhaps you, sh you should ask Ambassador Wright. I would love the opportunity to do just that. As to the second question, the, at the time, we were trying to get the FBI to Benghazi to begin its investigation. And that talk show actually provided an opportunity to, to make that happen. Afterwards, we encountered bureaucratic resistance for a long period from the Libyans. The Libyan government at this time is not very deep. President, prime minister, deputy prime ministers, ministers, all capable people. Some vice ministers as well. And it took us an additional two See, my math's not very fast these days, maybe 18 days to get the FBI team to, Beng to Benghazi. So the crime scene was unsecured for 18 days? Yes, sir. Witnesses were not interviewed? I would, would the gentleman would please finish up. We're going to try and be, move along. Yes, I will move on. Uh, we will finish this if there is a second round. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hicks. 
Thank you. Uh, for all individuals, to the extent that our witnesses can stay on, we, we will try to have a second round, but uh, the Ranking Member and I both realize that we are a little behind schedule, and I take blame for it, but we are going to try and move within five minutes of questioning whenever possible. The gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is this on? I want to thank uh, all the witnesses, and thank you for your, for your public service, and my condolences uh, to the families for your great loss. And I, I want to thank the American military. Uh, my father served in World War II, my brother in Vietnam, my husband in the Navy, and I can say after close observation, there is no place or no time that the American military wouldn't be there to protect American lives if they possibly could get there. And I find it truly disturbing and, and very unfortunate that when Americans come under attack, the first thing some did in this country was attack Americans, attack the military, attack the president, attack the State Department, attack the former senator from the great state of New York, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And I would like to ask uh, some questions about these attacks to get at the real facts. Last month, Chairman Issa went on national television and accused former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, accused her of lying under oath when she testified before Congress that she did not personally approve of security reductions in Libya. As proof, he claimed that she personally signed a cable denying request for additional security. And he stated, and I quote, the Secretary of State was just wrong. She said she did not participate in this, and yet, only a few months before the attack, she outright denied security in her signature in a cable in April 2012. The fact is that the Secretary did not sign this cable in 2012. Her name was typed at the bottom of the page, which is just the general procedure for thousands of cables that come out of the State Department every single year. So I would like to ask the panelists and our witnesses just one question. And it concerns the uh, State Department Correspondence Manual, which is posted on the Department's website. And this manual says, and I quote, the Communications Center will place the name of the Secretary on all telegrams to post, end quote. Now, I would like uh, to ask the panelists in a yes or no question, do you agree that uh, this is the proper procedure or the procedure that is followed uh, by, by the State Department? that thousands and thousands of cables leave the department headquarters every single year with the secretary's name um, at the bottom of the page or on the page. And I, I'm, I would like to know, um, Mr. Nordstrom, yes or no, do you agree with the manual? Is that the procedure of the State Department? That is my understanding of the prevailing yeah. Mr. Hicks, yes, yes or no? Yes, ma'am. Um, Mr. Thompson, yes or no, is that the procedure? Yes. Well. Two days after Chairman Issa made these accusations, the Washington Post uh, ran a uh, fact checker article called The Whopper. And I would like to ask uh, unanimous consent to place this in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Well, what the fact checker said was this quote, there was no basis or evidence to show that Clinton had anything to do with this cable, any more than she personally approved a cable on proper email etiquette. The odds are extremely long that Secretary Clinton ever saw or approved this memo, giving us confidence that these inflammatory and reckless language qualifies as a whopper and for Pinocchio's, end quote. 
So anyone who actually knows how the State Department operates knows that she was speaking the truth. She was talking about the procedure that was in the manual. There is no way in the world that she could sign every cable coming out. And when she said she didn't sign it, she did not sign it. So the gentlelady's time has expired, but if anyone wants to respond, they may. Hearing none, we'll go to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you all three for you being here, and thank you for the families, the loved ones who's, who passed away. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Hicks, I want to go back to that uh, first plane from Tripoli. It went from Tripoli, as, uh, as the, uh, noted in the ARB report, included seven rescue team members, including two, mili two U.S. military personnel. That plane then returns to Tripoli, and the first rescue team that is there is now really engaged in the attack. Uh, you have no idea, as my understanding, as to when the attack is going to end. So the rescue, second rescue team is preparing to go. And I want you, you mentioned it in your opening statement, but if you could please go back to what the second team, now the, the, the second team included four U.S. military. These are highly trained special forces personnel, one of which is a medic. And yet these military personnel do not operate under your authority, and your permission is not enough for them to go. Explain to me again exactly what happened. Again, we determined that we needed to send a second team from Tripoli to secure the airport for the withdrawal of our personnel from Benghazi after the mortar attack. But were any of these U.S. military personnel not permitted to travel on a rescue mission or relief mission to Benghazi? They were not authorized to travel. What happened with those personnel? They remained in Tripoli with us. The medic went with the nurse to the hospital to what? lend his skills to the treatment of our, and care of our wounded. How did the personnel react to being told to stand down? They were furious. I can only say, well, I will quote Lieutenant Colonel Gibson. He said, this is the first time in, in my career that a diplomat has more balls than somebody in the military. So the military is told to stand down, not engage in the fight. These are the kind of people willing to engage. What did, uh, where did that message come down? Where did the stand down order come from? I believe it came from uh, either AFRICOM or South Africa. Now my understanding is that General Ham was actually not in Stuttgart, where AFRICOM is headquartered, but he was in Washington, D.C., is that correct? I, I don't know the whereabouts of General Ham on that night. Mr. Chairman, this is something that we are going to have to continue to explore. I need to move quickly now to Mr. Thompson, if I could. You are the, uh, the leader there at the, what is called the FEST within the State Department. According to the State Department website, the FEST is the Foreign Emergency Support Team and the U.S. Government's only interagency on-call short-notice short team poised to respond to terrorist attacks uh, worldwide. I want to read to you an excerpt of an email sent by you to Kathleen Austin Ferguson on Tuesday, September 11, 2012, at 9.58 p.m. Could you help me understand who is Kathleen Austin Ferguson? She is Under Secretary Kennedy's deputy. You wrote, quote, I am told that Pat Kennedy participated in a very senior conference call with the White House and discouraged a FEST option. To remind, FEST has dedicated aircraft able to respond in four hours, is Department of State led and provides the below skills. When FBI was contacted, they responded that this situation would be better addressed via a FEST response. Thus, there are others who are thinking the same way, ready to discuss further as needed. Mark, two questions. Uh, were you, were, uh, can the gentleman suspend for a moment? Uh, earlier, uh, there was one document that had not been placed in the record uh, because it hadn't been provided through official channels. And I would ask that we get that. I think it came from Mr. Gowdy. And then, uh, Mr. Chaffetz, if you could make your document available so we could make copies. Uh, and then for any other members on either side of the dais, if you plan to use a document that is not currently committee record, and I realize since we have gotten very little, there is very little committee records, Please do us the favor of, of having copies so they can be distributed at or prior to the beginning of the questioning. Uh, I am sorry to interrupt. Mr. Chairman, no, just one, 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 one thing. Mr. Chairman, uh, as you recall yesterday, I said 
I reminded you that we had never, with regard to Mr. Thompson, this is the first time I, we've gotten a syllable from him. Right, and, it's, and yeah. we have no transcript right. of it yeah. either. I, but let me go on. One of the things I said in our conversation is that there, if there were any documents that were going to be used, we'd like to have had them yesterday. But, but with the regard to this document, and it sounds like a, it's a very crucial document, and in fairness to everybody, to all of us, and to Mr. Nordstrom, who said he wanted a complete hearing. We would just like to have that document, even if we had to suspend. So he, before, we would like to see the document that he is talking about. You know? Okay. I'm, in the case of this particular document, Mr. Chaffetz, is, uh, my understanding is you do have the document. Uh, so I will let staff work on that and, and provide additional time if, if needed, if that turns out not to be true. Uh, for our witnesses, if you have any documents you are going to refer to that we don't have, if you would have your counsels allow copies to be made. again. I want to make sure everyone has it as soon as possible. Obviously, if the State Department had made the documents they show us so-called in camera, if they would allowed us to have copies, we would all have a lot more documents. But thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That is for a different, different thank you argument. Much. Mr. Chaffetz, I am sorry. We will give you back a couple of seconds, and uh, you, the gentleman may continue. Mr. Thompson, do you recall that email? I do. Two questions. Were you ever given a detailed explanation as to why the FEST was not considered for deployment? And number two, did you attend or attempt to attend any senior meetings to plead your case for a FEST deployment? And if so, what happened? The reason I was given was that this was not the time for the FEST. Uh, it might be too unsafe for the FEST. Uh, and I got that through uh, Ms. Uh, Austin Ferguson. Uh, I. I re, uh, readdressed that with her. I readdressed it with her staff two days later. Um, Did you attempt to attend, attend any meetings? The next morning there were VTCs. Uh, I presumed I would be part of that. Uh, I was told not to attend those. Uh, although uh, CT was represented there, the FEST portion and the response portion of, of uh, the Counterterrorism Bureau was not represented there. So why were you not called into action? This is what you trained for. It's what tabletops are for. It's what you're prepared to do. Why was FEST not called into action? I do not know. Mr. Chairman, it's one of the great mysteries. Here we have this expertise. We've invested heavily in it. They tabletop it. They understand it. This is exactly what they trained for, and they were never asked to go into action. We had no idea how long or when this was going to end. I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and the gentleman is correct. We now recognize the lady from the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Thompson. First, I want to say uh, to the families that we continue to feel deeply about uh, your loss. I have uh, uh, some questions for Mr. Thompson uh, concerning the role of the Counterterrorism Bureau. Now, Mr. Thompson, your lawyer said you were unwilling to talk with any Democratic member. Uh, of this committee, so I've had to rely on statements that were made to the press. Your, your, uh, your own statement is mostly uh, biographical about the work you've done in Yemen and, and Latin America and the rest. Now, one report I found uh, indicated that you believe that Secretary Clinton and Ambassador Patrick Clinton uh, Kennedy, and here I'm quoting from this report, tried to cut the Counterterrorism Bureau out of the loop as they and other Obama administration officials weighed how to respond to and characterize the Benghazi attacks. Now, that's the end of that quote. Mr. Thompson, I'm asking you, is that a quote, is that quote accurate that you believe that the Counterterrorism Bureau was intentionally kept out of the loop for political reasons? It is not. I indicated that the portion of the Counterterrorism Bureau that responds to crises, i.e., my off part of the office, was pushed out of that discussion. The Counterterrorism Bureau was represented in subsequent meetings after the night of 9-11. So, but, not, but you, do you believe you were kept out for political reasons? This quote I, I, makes it. I, I do not uh, politicize my job, uh, Madam. I have served under three presidents, starting with President Clinton up to the present. 
Uh, I have served six secretaries. Uh, I've got to continue. Mr. Nine. Thompson, I, I, I was just quoting the quote. Time. So the quote isn't entirely accurate then? Correct. All right. That's very important for the record, that, that Mr. Thompson is not saying that they were kept out of the loop for political reasons. This week, um, this quote apparently caused your former boss in the Counterterrorism Bureau at the State Department, I'm speaking now of Ambassador Daniel Benjamin, to issue a public statement disagreeing with this allegation in particular, which was in quotes. And he, and he said, and I am now quoting him, it has been alleged that the State Department's Counterterrorism Bureau was cut out of the discussion and decision making in the aftermath of the Benghazi attacks. I ran the Bureau then and I can say with certainty that former, as the former coordinator for counterterrorism, that this charge is simply untrue. Do you agree with uh, Ambassador Benjamin? I agree that the Counterterrorism Bureau was included but there is a distinction with a difference with respect to the portion of the Counterterrorism Bureau that would be most effective in the aftermath of an attack. Now, all of this was under Ambassador compound. Uh, Benjamin. He didn't say one portion or the other. You are yourself saying, uh, although the Bureau was represented, um, somehow some portions of the Bureau were not represented. And why, how is that? That's what happened, ma'am. It says the Bureau, the Bureau, he says going on, was a central participant in the interagency discussion about the longer term response to Benghazi. At no time was the Bureau sidelined or otherwise kept from carrying out its task. This, now, that, this seems to me to directly contradict your testimony. Uh, here today. Well, <laughs> he says, I, I respectfully disagree. We were all in. You say, well, yeah, you were in, but somehow the other, uh, some part of it was not in. No other part of the Counterterrorism Bureau is responsible for responding to a crisis. This was a crisis. Uh, my office was in subsequent meetings. Other members of the office were. Uh, very professional people, and I'm sure they uh, did their best at those meetings. Well, we certainly don't want to get involved in, in you know, who down the chain of line gets consulted. Uh, but the, but the, the ambassador says after the attack, the first question to arise that involved the Counterterrorism Bureau was whether or not the Foreign Emergency Support Team should be deployed. The question of deployment was posed early. And the department decided against such a deployment, in my view, it was appropriate to pose the question, and the decision was a correct one. And now, were you aware that your superiors were consulted about the decision not to employ the foreign emergency support team? Uh, as uh, you, you can go ahead and as earlier you can go ahead and answer that, although the gentlelady's time has expired. Answer as, as earlier indicated, ma'am. Uh, I was told that by the Undersecretary of Management's office. The normal process for deploying the team is that at the Assistant Secretary level, at a counterterrorism security group at the White House, those options are discussed. At that uh, convening of that CSG, that decision is recommended or not recommended to the Deputies Committee. It is not solely a State Department function or authority to launch the Foreign Emergency Support Team, even though we are one part of it. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lankford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Hicks, when you arrived in July, the did the facilities in Benghazi meet the minimum OSPB security standards set by the State Department? According to the regional security officer at the time in, in Tripoli, John Martinek, they did not. What about the facilities in Tripoli? The Benghazi facilities did not meet the minimum standards of the facilities in Tripoli? Again, according to the regional security officer in Tripoli, John Martinek, they were very weak, yes. They did not meet. They did not meet. Do you, do you think they were close to meeting the standards? No, sir. Mr. Nordstrom, before you left, as the RSO, did the facilities have the number of security personnel that you had requested? No, they did not. 
Mr. Nordstrom, there are a very, very small number of facilities worldwide that are considered by GAO critical or high threat level for personnel serving in our different embassies and consulates. Tripoli and Benghazi, were they listed as critical or high threat level? Uh, they were. That was something that I had put in my written testimony as well. Correct. By statute, Mr. Nordstrom, who has the authority to place personnel in a facility that does not meet the minimum OSPB standards? Uh, as I had noted in there, the OSPB standards go in, uh, in tandem with SECA, which is Secure Embassy Construction, uh, both of which derived out of the East Africa bombings uh, or were strengthened after that. It is my understanding that since we were the sole occupants of both of those facilities, Benghazi and Tripoli, the only person who could grant waivers or exceptions to those was the Secretary of State. Mr. Hicks, why was Ambassador Stevens headed to Benghazi? There were a lot of concerns about him. There were a lot of security issues that Mr. Nordstrom has listed in numerous reports leading up to his trip there. Why was the Ambassador headed there? According to Chris, Secretary Clinton wanted Benghazi converted into a permanent constituent post. Timing for this decision was important. Chris needed to report before September 30th, the end of the fiscal year, on the physical and uh, the political and security environment in Benghazi to support a, an action memo to convert Benghazi from a temporary facility to a permanent facility. In addition, Chris wanted to make a symbolic gesture to the people of Benghazi that the United States stood behind their dream of establishing a new democracy. Why was this timing important? Was it significant that he went right now? Was there some hesitation about him going at that moment for that length of time? Could he have waited a couple more months to be able to go? He had originally planned to go to Benghazi in October, but we had a two-week gap in the principal officer position. Eric Gaudiosi was uh, departed on August 31st, and his replacement was not due in the country until September 15th. We covered the initial 10-day ten, ten period with David McFarland, and then the ambassador chose to go. And, and again, he chose to go for those reasons. What was the timeline on trying to make this a permanent facility, or was there anything pending uh, that, that had to be accomplished by a certain deadline? We had funds available uh, that, we could, that could be transferred from uh, an account set aside for Iraq and could be dedicated to this purpose. They had to be obligated by September 30th. Okay. And wh where did those instructions come from? This came from the Executive Office of the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs. So they were told to go ahead and check everything out, get the process going in Benghazi, because we had to do it and we had to do it right now. He planned to go in October, but said we, we've got to get there earlier and get this started in, plus there was an opening as well of the prin principal officer. That's right. Uh, Mr. Nordstrom, uh, on uh, March the 28th, uh, there is a cable that you sent to Washington requesting a, uh, to keep the diplomatic security that you already had on the ground, that level of security, and not have that level of security decreased. Did you draft that cable? I did. Who, who was the intended recipient of that cable? Uh, the, generally, those types of requests would go to our diplomatic security uh, personnel, uh, certainly DAS uh, Charlene Lamb, who was with me before in October, testified, uh, and certainly to uh, Undersecretary of Management and uh, Near Eastern Affairs would typically be the distribution for that. Okay. Thank you. My time is expiring. I thank